cuando vos entras a la cancha, se va la vida, se va todo. Even as a Germany fan, a West Germany fan, you couldn't help but be amazed at what this guy could do. He went to a team that was about to be relegated and he won the most difficult league championship that has ever been. For that reason, for me, it's Maradona. You've got to admire him for what he did over the years. Uh, bit of a controversial character as well, so I think he's really interesting, which is why I'm quite excited to see the film, actually. Big fan, yeah, and the handball and all that, like, I forgive him for tonight. He was just mesmerising to watch. Because he's a big ego, because he's a big character, people didn't like him. And I think, you know, you only have to see the footage of him in those dressing rooms. Fue una carga. Ser tan famoso. So after Senna and Amy, the third in your trilogy is Diego Maradona. Was was he always the person you wanted for this, or was there were there any other people? What made you choose him, or did he choose you? He's obviously a fan of Senna, from what I can gather. I mean. I mean, yeah, obviously, when we started with Senna, there was never any thought of a trilogy. It was like a one-off. We just sort of making this film because the opportunity came along. And then I did get offered a few sort of sporty films, and I thought, I don't really want to do another one straight away. In fact, Paul Martin, who is here, hopefully, he was one of the producers, initially contacted me after Senna and said, you know, there's this footage, there's this private archive on Diego Maradona, would you be interested? And because I'd just done a film about a Brazilian sporting hero, I wasn't sure if I was ready to go straight into the uh, Argentinian sporting hero immediately. So it didn't quite kind of work out. Um, it went away, we made Amy, did a few other things, all of us have made other projects. And then when the project did come back again, I put um, James Gay Reese, the other producer, and Paul Martin started wor working together, and they went off to investigate. Probably a story best told by Paul Martin, actually. But um, they went off to investigate footage and went to outside of Naples. And that's when the kind of idea became real. And it felt, for me, like, if we're going to do three films, the idea of having a third film about someone who is still alive, who is still around, who's older, um, and has a very different kind of life, and, you know, in a way, more complex, I would say. That felt right, the reason to do it. Um, but as a football fan, I kind of knew about him more than I probably knew about Edson Senna or Amy going in. And Chris, um, when you were ed did you make the decision to focus on the Naples part of it when you were editing, or is that something that came before? Because it's obviously a microcosm of his of his existence is in is in Naples. Yeah, we only really arrived at that decision relatively late. That it was a microcosm of his uh, uh, of his life in a way, or a paradigm for his life. I mean, initially. The footage that Asif was describing um, was the result of uh, the ambition of his first manager, a guy called Jorge Sitispiller, who decided that he'd, uh, he'd arranged this huge transfer fee for Diego to go to Barcelona, the record fee at the time, and thought that in addition to his fame in the footballing world, Diego should be known in North America, not really known for their love of football at the time. So he hired a couple of camera people to follow him around and made a film about Diego, which was terrible, uh, to try and launch him in America, complete with an Orson Welles kind of voiceover describing football, soccer. And, and Kenny Everett graphics, I think. And say. Kenny Everett graphics as well. But we managed, they're the rushes that we managed to get. Uh, and so wherever we assembled the film, and we cut his story from childhood right through till now, initially, a very, very long edit. But whenever it got to Naples, the story came to life, and we always said, that's the film. It's, it, it probably will start as it, with his arrival to Naples, but we'll do due diligence and we'll follow. And Barcelona was a great story. His time there, it was two years. It was very rich and full of drama. It was the time where he first came in contact with cocaine. He had not very much success there. He was ill, but he also suffered some sort of racial persecution by the Catalans. And it was dramatic and great stuff, but we realized inevitably we kept on coming back to Naples and that being the time where 
he hit the greatest heights in his career um, domestically in terms of the league there and obviously with the World Cup. And it was the beginning of everything that was going to go wrong in his life. And once he left there, nothing that he did subsequently ever really achieved anything more. And the problems that were created in Barcelona, in Naples, sorry, um, never really got cured and are still probably around today. So that's why we focused on that particular time. But it's worth mentioning what Chris saying, the longer version. So in a cut, like about 15 months ago, a year before we sort of finished it, the opening sequence up to the point when he got to Naples was 45 minutes. And that's our mad five minute opening, crazy, you know, French connection, Italian job opening now. Uh, that's the tough call we had to make. There's lots of great stuff. And the bit after he left Naples was about 30 minutes as well, mm. um, which kind of went into like his children and various things in Cuba and everything. I mean, it's an incredibly long and rich and dark and heavy story at times. Um, but we did want to try to make something that you could watch at the cinema in one go. And, and that's why you have to pick and choose your battles. Was there any thought about making it a kind of a, a multi-part series of like on, maybe on TV, with the, like the 30 for 30 ESPN? Not, not between us two. No. no, for me, that that's why it became a trilogy. Because Senna was made for the cinema, Amy was made for the cinema, and when we started it, I remember thinking, I don't know what's going to happen to the film industry, right? At the time, it was 2015 when the deals were being discussed, and it was like, you know, these kind of digital companies are coming, and there's lots of money around, and it's going to change the world. I still like going to the cinema. I like seeing things with an audience collectively. I stay awake that way. If I'm at home, I think about biscuit or chocolate, or looking at my email, and I'm a bad viewer, personally. And also, they never seem to end, and they're always too long for me. I'm like, why can't you just make it shorter? So we decided to do the work for you. And we like a big crowd in a dark room, and everyone appreciates it. And we want to sit in together. Naples, we want to sit in Argentina, we want to sit in England. You know, we want to see it with an audience. And I think that's where the trilogy idea came from. Three films that we made about these characters, about fame, about the battles and struggles, but made for the cinema. It's very kind of you. Talk to us about what it was like working with Maradona and trying to get him to agree to this and then trying to get the information out of him that you need to make the film. I mean, the agreement thing was a really interesting one because you'd think we'd have to... Go. I mean, I wasn't party to that conversation. That was really the producers, um, James Gay Reese and Paul Martin, who... Paul, who initially knew about this footage that had been shot by, by these two Argentinian cameramen, they went off to investigate uh, kind of outside of Naples, saw some of the tapes, which was all on this old format called Umatic, um, and they then went off to meet with Diego Maradona's lawyer, um, who I believe Diego was here because of um, the Davis Cup or something. He's a big tennis fan. So they were here in, West, in sort of central London, and they had a meeting with the lawyer and were able to do a deal. It's really, I only came on board after that. Um, what I was told was I would have three interviews with Diego Maradona, each about, say, three hours long. That was a deal, which for me isn't a lot. When I did Senna and Amy, there were lots of interviews that would gone for five hours. And, you know, the idea was to kind of make people forget the process. And I'm kind of thinking the last 15 minutes of the bit we're going to use, but we've got to kind of get to know one another and they've got to, I've got to earn their trust. With Diego, that's not possible. Invariably, it would turn out each interview, if I was lucky, would last about 90 minutes. That's his attention span for... Who knows what reason? Um, but that's kind of how it worked. And so it would kind of the energy would drop off after that. And it, would better, it was better to just go away and come back the next day. Um, and then I would say, over the interviews, my, my feeling was he, once he got engaged by the process and just talking, you know, he's, a, he's really charismatic. He's a really good storyteller. He remembers and he, he, he talks really well. And um, I don't know, maybe Chris, you should talk about what you felt when you heard it. Because obviously I'm in the room with him. And sometimes there is the frustration, you know, all of the people probably we would have to wait to meet have all left already, but you know what it's like. Anyone that's mildly famous, they make you wait. That's normal. That comes with a job. Um, but what did you think of when I you was a little it? concerned about his interviews to start with because his voice was very old. It sounded very old. He didn't sound like the young man we were seeing on screen. And what we've done traditionally with the last two films is had interviews recorded at the time, which made you feel like you were living the journey with the subjects of the film. And we struggled at first, or at least I struggled at first, with matching that older voice with the younger day, Diego. But I found ways to edit it and to clip it and to slightly adjust the quality of the sound recording. And you couldn't ignore the fact that he was telling us about that first time he walked into the room and there were the Camorra. Uh, and these are things that uh, you know have been hinted at in the past, but he's never, ever told anyone about that. He's never, ever explained as eloquently as he did what happened when he arrived in Italy and realized that he was playing this completely different style of football and that he was going to adapt his style of play. And once you started to marry that voice with the imagery, uh, you realized that you were going to get a unique insight, something that we weren't able to get 
um, because we could actually ask him these questions. What was that like? And fish around, and that's just very, very good at asking questions and then leaving it and coming back and asking the same question in a slightly different way an hour later and then leaving it and coming back the next day and asking the same, and finally getting, and we get three chunks of an answer and we use all three of those chunks and add them together and turn it into one beautifully eloquent soliloquy by Diego Maradona about things. So I thought actually in the end it benefited the film and he was very candid about most of the really gripping uh, issues in his life. Um, and I think it's a more interesting film for having his voice now in there. Even though we don't differentiate, you don't know when it's him now and him at the time. I think we deliberately blurred that. We didn't feel like we were going to announce this is Diego now because obviously there are so many temporal shifts going on in the film. I think you'd probably find it hard to locate yourself. But nonetheless, I think it was a very good interview at the end or a very extended thing. I think I'm still owed one. My, my, our maths may differ, uh, Diego, the lawyers and myself, but I thought we still had one left, and my plan was always, we, we have the film, we finish it, we show it to him, and then we do the final one, because then, hopefully, by looking at it, he'll then remember things in a different way. He may disagree with a few things that are in the film, and then I'll be like, okay, fine, tell me what happened then. Um, uh, but then, you know, as I explained at the beginning, the kind of complexity of meeting him the first time was a bit the same when we then tried to show him the film. So I think it was last March, uh, we felt, we've got a movie, it's time to show it to him. Um, you know, we'd met him in Dubai four times, say, so it's like, let's come to Dubai. And his people were like, well, you know, he might not be in Dubai for long. Okay, what, what, where's he going to go? He's going to Belarus. Okay, because I think he took a job in Belarus at one point. Yeah. Okay, uh, where's Belarus? Well, let's look on a map. Um, and it's like, no, actually, he's going to be in Colombia. So he's like, okay, how do we, uh, I don't know if we can get to Colombia. Uh, and then he was going to go to the World Cup in, in, in Moscow. And he's like, come to Moscow during the World Cup. Uh, as we've seen, that probably wasn't the best time to show him this film. So then I thought, maybe not. Um, where are you going next? He said, I'll be on a holiday in Argentina. So we actually booked tickets. We're ready to go to Argentina. Two days before we go to Argentina, he took a job in Mexico. And so he hasn't seen it yet. Have any of his family seen it? Or have you had any feedback? So then we that? did the opposite thing. We just like, let's show it to everyone else. And so we've shown it to his ex-wife, to his children, to his you know, previous girlfriend, to his biographer, Daniel Arcucci, is in the film. Fernando Signorini is a key person. Um, who, and they've all seen it. And they all say, you know, at times it's tough, but it's honest. The film's straight. And you've, you've kind of done what kind of people have tried but haven't managed to do. Yeah. Um, so no, they all say it's, it's good. And I think they have actually reached out to him and said, you should probably see this at some stage, but so far he's declined the offer. Diego doesn't do what he's told, so you know it'll be his idea at some point, and yeah. that's when we'll show it to him. Yeah. And the the footage, Chris, within it, um, I mean, there's the amazing footage of him going into Sao Paulo, with the fans there when he signs, and then there's the footage at the Christmas parties, the first one where he's a life and soul, and the second one where he's just kind of looking into the middle distance. How, how do you go about sourcing that footage and, and then putting it together? The footage, as I said, came from a couple of guys that were hired in Barcelona and then just ended up kind of being part of his entourage. And they became part of the family in a way. They turned up, they went back to Argentina and filmed at home at Christmas with his family and, and covered every single match, which is why you probably those football fans noticed that we've just really tried to undo decades of innovation in television coverage of football and go back to some guy standing on the side of the pitch with a camera and the men running around in front of you. But that put you right in the action as far as we were concerned. We really wanted to do that. Um, and you could see, if you initially, a lot of it is quite banal. I mean, there's a lot of football, and if you like football, it was great. But if you didn't understand who was playing who or what the significance of any particular match was, it was just endless. Blue shirts running around, and you had to deduce. They weren't all labelled even, so we had to work out which match was which. But you knew that if you took a bit from that beginning, when he arrived there, and you took a bit in the middle, and you took a bit at the end, and you just literally cut those three shots of his face together, you s the whole story was there. You saw his face just change. You saw his f the, 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 f the physical nature of his face change, and you saw a sadness and a melancholy come in. So you know that behind that, there was going to be a really great story. And really, we, we then fished around. We met the ultra, Gennaro Montori. Asif went and met him. He said, oh, I've got a tape. It's always the case when we make these films. People say, oh, I've got a couple of things. I've got a couple of things. And you just add these successive little moments that build it up, and gradually you get this mosaic. I don't think, watching it tonight again, we quite understood how intense and 
chaotic the whole thing is. It must be must feel like that for you watching it for the first time. If you're unprepared for that, it feels like it's going to be a, a sporting documentary, but it isn't anything like that. It's a pummeling, chaotic thing, and it echoes his. It's a real reflection of his character. We we try to do that in all the films. That the films themselves feel something like the person we're making the film about. And this film is is kind of a big, crazy monster of a thing, isn't it? Constantly it's just grabbing, yeah. touching, grabbing, pushing, it's totally physical. So, I think the time in Naples felt felt really claustrophobic. The soundtrack uh, contributed to that, and it it kind of echoed how it, how he was feeling towards the end of that. I think mm. you guys went to Naples and and interviewed people. How how did Asif? How did they how did they receive you over there? Because obviously it didn't end well with with Maradona over there. I think right now everyone loves him. I mean, um, the kind of mention has to go to, you know, the, the two archive producers, um, Lena and Fiumetta. I don't know if they're both here. No, Fiumetta, I don't know if Lena's here, but they did the work. They met the people. They did. They uh, had to kind of license the footage. They had to kind of make the kind of connections and read all the books that were not, you know, in English in order to find out who's who. And I think they, they were the ones who kind of made contact. Montori is a, a very unique character. You know, I, it's impossible to explain what this guy's like, but he had lots of VHS tapes from the time when they spent, you know, Diego would come to his house and have dinner all the time. So that shot of him, like what we call a Long Good Friday shot, which is just his face for two minutes, just thinking it all through, actually did come from Montori. Um, and there's a few other brilliant moments like that. The um, bowling alley at the beginning. When the bowling alley, arrived. that kind of, how can you show what it's like to get to Naples and just be surrounded by people constantly um, and that was the best example, and you know, that's the kind of thing no one's ever heard of, that's not mentioned in a book, but Montori had a camera. Now, if you ask the Neapolitans, they don't see a problem with that. That's the thing, they're just like, we just love him, he's great. We just want to touch him, have a picture. Get, and, and that is the thing, and I think even now, there's an element of that. We just loved him, what's the problem? What do you mean there was an issue, you know? There's still gonna be a bit of that, the film, I think. Aren't they? I mean, from what we, the, the people that we've met from, from Naples so far seems to be just happy that they're in the spotlight again, and they're, 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 you know, the city is basking in, again, a bit of attention from the rest of the world. That's our take. Fair enough. And, um, and going back to the, the footage of the actual games, um, a lot of that was obviously focused on, on Diego himself, and that's not footage you often see from the, from the actual transmission broadcast, and it, the little bits of that were like Zidane, the 21st century portrait. Was that, was that stuff that was actually recorded by the broadcasters originally, or is that something you had to get hold of in differently? It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mosaic. There, a lot of it, it would always came, it always came to life when we were watching it in the cutting room. When it went to that view from the side of the pitch by his camera guy, who wasn't exclusively following, but was basically following wherever Diego was. And then if there was a bit of action somewhere else, he'd cover that. But mostly he was following Diego. Um, and then I needed something to cut to sometimes, so we would look at the Rye coverage or the coverage from whoever else was doing it, and they invariably went to that big top shot from halfway up the stands, and it looked terrible on a big screen, and we decided we just didn't want to go there whatsoever. It killed the excitement, killed the kinetic energy of the players running around. But they quite often showed a slow-motion replay of a goal or an interesting piece of action. So I would take, and that was from pitch side cameras. One camera was pitch side. So I would take the slow mo, and then I would speed the slow mo back up to normal speed, and then cut that into the other footage. So I had two angles on certain pieces of action. So post production was a bit of a nightmare for the guys that had to take Very that. Very technical. It's actually quite complicated. What Chris does is unbelievable. Yeah. And you know, the people who kind of take it on after Chris has finished editing to do the next stage to deliver the film and finish it pretty much always say that these films are far more complex than a lot of big kind of fiction feature films that they work on because it's every single shot has had something done to it to make it say what we want it to say and and kind of the other thing i would say that you know the the, the wide shot the football films are hard to do right there are very few that i think have worked because 22 people running around on a big wide pitch it's really hard to believe you know when people try to fake it pl actors can't play players can't act you know, the fans, you can't have the logo, so you look at it, that's not real. It's like not, no one's wearing anything other than certain colours. You know, it just doesn't, to me, ever look believable. Are you and talking so, about Escape to Victory by any chance? <laughs> who, yeah, anyway, Stallone in goal or whatever. But, but it was just this idea of kind of showing it, but also making it look a bit messy, because it was at the time. And yet, as close-ups, that, that became interesting. And uh, actually, what I like about it is, you know, we don't go into the detail of every match, how many goals are scored. You're just going to get the essence of the story. You have to kind of go with that, because... If you get caught up in the detail of every match, you just get lost. 
Um, and it was one of the challenges. I mean, you know, hopefully we've got the balance right of how much football for the people who are really hardcore football fans, to, they want that. But people who are not interested in football, you don't want to have too much that they're just like, oh, God, this is so you know, exhausting and boring. And it's a hard one to gauge, and hopefully we found the right balance. In terms of, in terms of Maradona, obviously the on-pitch stuff is, is what everyone knows. As if how difficult was it to get him to talk about you know, his son and the Kimura and the whole of that, the, the, the dark side of his, his personality and his life? So that, I mean, that was really what, what, in this case, was complicated compared to Senna and Amy, where it was a lot easier. Most of Senna, most of Amy, Amy specifically took place in London. It's a London film. So if I wanted to meet someone, I could kind of organize it. And if it didn't work, I can go back a week later, a few weeks later. In this case, to meet with Maradona, you know, the first time we met him, it took quite a few months to set up. By the time we met him, I probably didn't see him again for a year almost. You know, we just edited for a year, put the film together, go to meet him. And then the second meeting is going well. And I've got my kind of questions on a, in my mind. And I ask him about his ex-wife. She's like, do not bring her up. I never want to hear about her. OK, that's one of the easy questions, right? So, OK, and then I was like, uh, what about, you know, Jorge Sister Spieler, the guy who kind of was your agent? He's like, he stole from me. I don't want to talk about him. He's like, oh, God. Right, these are, these are like the kind of just to break the ice questions. So um, then it's like, well, let's talk about your family. Let's talk about you. And that kind of, he was very happy to about his mum and his dad and talking about his childhood. And then it's like, well, let's just do some bankers. So that whole trip, I never got to anything tricky. It was just like, let's talk about you. But also, let's talk about the football. Let's talk about the easy stuff. OK, get that. We've got that. We go away. Another six months before I see him. Now, the process is complicated by the fact that he speaks a very particular Diego Maradona Argentinian Spanish, which not everyone speaks. <laughs> he invents terms, he invents phrases. You know, Chris can talk about how you cut it with him. I don't speak Spanish. So that I'm working with a translator who might be in my ear, and I'm always a little bit delayed. And then for me, it's not until we come back to England and it's all being, you know, um, turned to English and put onto the kind of, then I understand what we actually were talking about. You know, and then Chris can start cutting. Then we go back again, and the final interview is like, okay, now we've got to deal with, we've got to deal with the kind of, family, we've got to deal with kind of relationships with the Kimura, we've got to deal with the children, we've got to deal with the drugs and all that. And he is a master of kind of deception. You ask him a question about his son and he'll give you a brilliant answer about Seb Blatter, you know, which, which for a lot of people, like, this is gold dust, right? And he knows I've just given you a great headline. But in our case, it's like, that's, yeah, that's great. Can we just come back to the question? And that happened a few times. And he did get a little bit Got cold in that room in Dubai, I have to say. Got a bit awkward. He did look at me and say, uh, you've got a real nerve asking me these questions. <laughs> to my face, to ask me that to my face. But for that, I respect you. <laughs> now, I've got on the time delay translation, so I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, ah, OK, cool. Right. And you know, it was like that. And then he kind of it's like, okay, great, can we answer the question then? So we kind of got there eventually, but he's not used to being interrupted. And occasionally I knew I had 90 minutes. And if he goes off for 20 minutes to talk about, you know, FIFA, that's not really what our film's going to be about, I don't think. So it was hard. We did get there eventually, but there was definitely a moment when he was like, okay, enough, I've had enough, right, go. And the interview ended quite abruptly. And from that experience, I mean, it's, it's mentioned a lot in the film that there's Diego, and then there's Maradona. And now he's retired and he's, you know, he's out of Italy. What do you think he is now? Is he, is he back as Diego again, or is he still a mixture of the two? I would say, um, kind of what I said right at the beginning, if you imagine kind of the spectrum of Diego on one end and Maradona on the other end, I think he's basically somewhere over here now. You know, pretty much everyone that we spoke to that knew him then says that version of Diego's gone. I mean, he has been through a lot. Of, his body has been through a lot. He's died many times many more times than Jesus and come back, right? So he is like, the guy's amazing, but he's also, you know, he's been through a lot. He's physically, mentally been through a lot. So for me, the guy that I'm meeting, what everyone who knows him and who knew him then says, you know, he's pretty much on that end of the spectrum really now. Um, and so I, that's what I meant by the person we were making the film about and the person you see in the interviews is very different to the person you meet now. But that happens to all of us when we get old. You know, maybe we're not. We remember life the way we want to remember it. He remembers it how he wants to remember it. And that's why I was hoping to show him the film to see if he had a different connection to himself. And those great days, those amazing things, the way he looked, the way he played, the way he danced. Um, but that's still, you know, to be done. Maybe he'll visit the cinema in Dubai and watch it on his own. You never know. He's in Mexico in Sinaloa, Sinaloa right now, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, I will, I'm not in a hurry to get there. Um, <laughs> but I'll catch him at something in Buenos Aires, I hope. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, I think we, we can ask for a few questions. When is it going to be released in Argentina? When's it coming out in Argentina? I think the plan for Argentina is going to be coming out in the, uh, I think it's around September time, in Latin America. So there's a North American and Latin American release will be later in the year, so September, October is the plan. I just wondered, um, is it two, did you say it was a two-year edit? Two years, yeah, yeah, roughly, yeah, roughly a year, eighteen months, something like that. Do you do you do you always feel like you've got a sort of a plan and a process, or did you ever get to a point where you just thought, oh, this is just a nightmare. We're never ever going to finish it. And do you guys argue at all, or no? We never ever argue. <laughs> we never ever disagree. And no, obviously, it's you you we you form a weird relationship with this character that you're working on for two years or or so and. Yeah, I mean, we, we start these films with very s deliberately, with very scant knowledge, with just what we bring to the room. We walk in and we go on the evidence that's presented to us as that accumulates. So it's not like we go in there with a script. We have no idea where to begin. The first experiments are just like, well, what do we do with this kind of footage? How do we deal with, for instance, a lot of material that doesn't have any sound on it, mute material? So how do I turn that into something which is going to feel naturalistic? And then... It's just a process of wading in, to be honest. We kind of pick an arbitrary point and start accumulating stuff. Asif will say, you've got to hear this bit of interview, you've got to hear this, and then we bounce it around. And it's a very organic thing. And then bit by bit, over the space of the first six months, say, you get a big chunk of material, maybe an hour or so on the timeline, and then you can just watch that back. And invariably, whenever we did that and had people come and watch it with us, they said, Naples, 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 Naples. So we started eventually focusing on that. And then it's just a question of refinement of, and, and new things coming in all the time, new bits of interview, as of going off and interviewing people constantly, all the time. You know, obviously, Fernando Signorini was an Im amazing a character who transformed the film because his ins insights and his honesty about Diego and the close relationship and the care that he had for him made him invaluable. The same with Daniel Arcucci. And these were people who were interviews that were picked up along the way. Maybe they'd been research interviews and then they were went back and there were re-interviews. And so... It kind of just rumbles on in this strange way, but you know we never really disagreed on what the film was ultimately going to be. It's just a question of refinement and of, and then weirdly, you get to a point where you feel confident that actually that's the film, and that's really the point that editing, as most people understand it, begins, where you start yeah. looking at it and going, right, how do we make this? We had a three-hour cut. Three hours. Which how do we screen. make this interesting? How do we make this bit zippy and fast and recut things and then begin? editing the film yeah. once we've got the story down. It takes there. two years to get to that point, yeah. to, to a point where we think we have a rough cut. And then we, sh we do show the film quite often to people and different people come in to see different versions and, and you kind of get gauge their reaction. The important thing, like, like Chris said, we never have a script. We th cast the net really, really wide. Um, the upside of our kind of relationship with our producers and how we've worked in the past is that we have time. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing because essentially those first two years is kind of the equivalent of writing a script of work, doing your homework, doing your research, having a script, and then say, now we start making a film. Um, and yeah, and by then, hopefully, you've got all of the elements and the characters and the pieces. I think on this film, there were about 80 interviews um, done um, in Argentina, in the UK, and in Italy. I think there might be 15, 17 voices in the film. So a lot of the research, you know, we talk for hours, but they never end up in a movie. Um, and the idea for me is always to look at the footage and say, who's that standing next to Diego? Who's that person there? Who's that over there? You know, and not to go from you know, some written text or something like that, but to see who's actually next to him and then find that person. That's the idea. It is quite like detective work. Mm. Just when you first saw the footage that came through from the two guys who'd been filming, Maradona in Naples, did you sense that this was a period where he was revered for, and, and seemed to be having the time of his life, that they sense this darkness in him? When you're looking at that footage and you see those close-ups of his face, did you think the people who were tracking him sensed no, the complications or not at all? Was it just definitely not? No, they, 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 they had a very specific task. Turn up on the day, film him. Always, we, I mean, there are so many matches that begin in exactly the same way. It was always, they'd stand on a certain part of the pitch, he would run out, and they, he would do exactly the same little flag giving ceremony and get on with the match, and then they would follow him back down the tunnel, then there might be a bit later, and then there would be a family birthday, he would turn up on the big occasion. So it was banal, a lot of it. Unless you really knew what you were looking for, it was 
had just a lot of the same, uh, apparently the same looking material. It was only for us, you know, like that shot, I probably went through two or three times thinking, oh yeah, that's just a nappy Christmas party. Not much happened then. It was only when you watch it later, when you've kind of got the story, and then we go, okay, what happened there? Oh yeah, he goes to that Christmas party. And then you saw that moment, tried pulling the sound out, and you realize, look at that expression playing itself over his face and how long that lasts. So we tried him, but no, I don't think they knew, um, and they didn't know, everyone was aware of what was going on in his life. That was a completely open secret at the time to everybody in that city, and uh, apart from maybe Claudia. I, I think by then they'd been fired. Really? Yeah, that shot. Oh, that's Montori, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that's, that's the right. key thing. There was a point when it got heavy that the second manager who came along got rid of him. And so that footage you're talking about, and also this is kind of filmmaking. So if you set up the story in a way and you find a shot, we all read into it because that's what we want you to think. It's going on, but you know, who knows? He could be thinking about dessert, but I don't think he was. Uh, but it is to do with the scene that precedes it and the scene that comes after it and what we do with the sound. So a lot of that is the kind of technical genius of, of Chris and kind of that's the, that's the technical bit that we do. We find all the material, but it just joining it together doesn't tell you a story. Um, but yeah, that footage is someone else mm. who did have the nerve to just keep on his face for that long and not think, he's a bit boring today, isn't he? But <laughs> let's look at Chiro Ferrara. No, he stayed on him because he's, yeah. And, and so yeah, that's why it's the long Good Friday shot. Are there any particular stories or aspects of his story that you regret not being able to include? There's some great DVD extras, I've got to say. I mean, I don't normally say because on Senna and Amy, we, we, I don't think we could license much. But in this case, because we've got all of this material from these two blokes, um, and there were some amazing things, so which Chris and I went through only a couple of weeks ago. We should have delivered this ages ago. We're a bit behind. Um, and we're both going, that's great. Why isn't that in a the film? There's a lot of Barcelona, isn't there? There's, some I mean, there's a lot of material. That, but because we, we had to make a choice about where to focus the story, and, and Naples was it, and we reduced Barcelona to that bits and pieces in that opening five minutes. But the way that he had his leg broken and his recovery from that terrible injury and... Uh, and he was expected to be out for a year or... And talking about it, the way he talks about, you know, hearing his leg snap like a piece of wood, and so all of that, we did interview him about all of it. And the operation, and, and then his recovery from the surgery, and then his comeback, and, you know, literally his first match, he came back, scored a couple of goals, didn't he? With the foot that had been broken on purpose, just to show that he was back. So all that stuff is marvellous, and some of it will be on the Blu-ray or whatever, so... That's the stuff I think is... Yeah, there's quite a lot of fun stuff. I don't think it would work if we had to play it at length in this film. It's that, that operation, the, the, the broken leg, and then the, the part where he was then escorted out of the stadium, and that was all filmed, right? Yeah. So, so when he comes off the pitch, he's carried on a stretcher, just that kind of incident between kind of Goika Cheya and, and Maradona. And then the cameraman follow him through the stadium, and there's this moment where you've got the most expensive player in the world who's literally been put on the floor of a car park and he's, like, sitting, he's lying on the floor, covered in this kind of blanket, while they're trying to figure out what do we do with him. And then they, um, and his wife's there kind of waving paper over his face. I mean, it's mad when you, this is what football used to be like. You know, the most expensive player in the world gets his ankle broken, and they've got no idea what to do with him. And they call the ambulance, and the ambulance sort of comes, and it's almost, like, almost in real time. Ambulance looks like the kind of car in Ghostbusters, I always think. Yeah. And that arrives, and they kind of throw him into this car. And, and as they're carrying him down, they're going, don't drop him, don't, don't drop, drop him, him. don't drop him. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it's funny, but it's also like, it's, this is what football was like, and it's not that long ago. And then uh, they film everything. They film the operation, like, in gory detail. That's a suitably, That's an example, yeah. Yeah, it's a suitably ludicrous place to finish. Um, thanks for the film, uh, and thanks for your time, Asif Kapadia and Chris King. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.